thank you for uh, this, uh, joining us on this uh, interview. Sure. And uh, basically, uh, let's start with uh, in, you have been in the, in the government of India as well as with the World Bank. So you have a good knowledge of the Indian uh, system as well as the World Bank. So uh, tell us a bit about your uh, present assignment. Uh, what what is this uh, climate change disaster risk management in South Asia? What are you specifically working on at present on in this uh, field? So uh, yeah, so I'm the manager for the South Asia team of the World Bank that looks after world uh, disaster uh, climate change and disaster risk management. So in that capacity, there are a few things that we do. So I manage a portfolio of about $4 billion of lending uh, on disaster risk management and climate change. Uh, and that involves a variety of uh, projects. So it will include things like post-disaster reconstruction. Uh, but increasingly now we are also going for uh, sort of preventive investments in disaster risk management, like early warning systems, hydromet services, urban drainage, uh, things like that. And um, and then there's also a strong climate adaptation angle. So, for example, in Pakistan, we have a project called the Sindh Resilience Project, where we're investing in things like uh, tree plantation, uh, mangrove restoration, uh, that sort of uh, sort of help help prepare countries for disasters before they happen. So that's in short. Okay. And then there's another very big part of my program, which is uh, that I assist or my team assists all the World Bank uh, teams in South Asia. So not just in my unit, but you know, for some, for example, somebody working on power or energy or say urban development. So my team helps them in uh, boosting the climate co-benefits of their projects. So that what that means is that the percentage of the financing that's dedicated towards um, either mitigation, climate mitigation or climate adaptation. So that's in summary. Hmm. Okay, well, there's a group, uh, the entire group is called Urban Resilience and Land Global Practice in the World Bank. Yes, yes. Uh, that is basically focused on uh, urban uh, no. resilience. No, so I'm part of that group also. So we have a matrix system in the bank where I'm reporting to a global practice, but I'm embedded in a region. So the, so the urban, uh, it's called the Urban Resilience and Land Global Practice. But it's not just about urban. So urban development is part of it. Uh, there's a very strange echo. I don't know. Uh, uh, so the urban uh, development, yeah, but also things like uh, climate change and uh, disaster risk management, and uh, the land management is also a new part of this. And in under that, what we do is things like dig digital cadastres, sort of upgrading land administration systems. Mm. So that goes into the uh, agriculture and land use. That's right. Part of it. Yeah. Uh, what do you think are the most serious uh, challenges uh, for South Asia and ASEAN? Because I, I see you have been in most of the Southeast Asian countries as well. Yes. Uh, as far as uh, uh, this kind of climate change in related disasters, what are the most serious uh, challenges? So I think, um, you know, even if you look at a few years ago, the, the the consensus view was that climate change is something that will happen in the future. You know that yes, we should be worried about it, but it's not an emergency. I think that view has changed in the I would say in the last few years certainly. So if you take just one one indicator, which is like urban flooding, and you look across Asia, there is hardly any major city in Asia, and I'm counting the whole of Asia. You know that includes China, India, Indonesia, um, Vietnam. There's hardly any major city that has not had a major urban flooding event. And that, to my mind, kind of indicates the severity of the problem. So we're seeing more and more extreme weather events. Um, and it's not just flooding. So, for example, urban heat waves, this is something that has that was not you know, in, on our radar screen till very recently. But just this year, the, there was a city in Pakistan called Jakobabad, which hit 50 degrees centigrade which is more beyond the capacity of the human body to, to, to resist, mm. uh, to survive. Now, these are the kind of issues that are now becoming front and center. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the view uh, within many developing countries was that this is not a problem that we have caused. You know, we, we, did, we did not put the carbon into the atmosphere. It is really the developed countries that have done that 
So it is, you know, it is up to them to help us solve it. I think that view is no longer, um, how should I say, it? it's not a salient view because whatever the Western countries do or not do, um, and I'm not talking about the, you know, the equity or the justice part of it. That, that, that's a separate sure. argument. What I'm saying is that we are being hit hard, regardless of who created the problem. So, so, so that to me seems to be the most uh, sort of urgent issue right now, which is that, uh, take the case of infrastructure. So any infrastructure that is built today, uh, whether it is say a metro rail line or housing or anything you would say, it has a lifetime of say 40, 50 years. So that means that any infrastructure being put in place today has to be designed for a world that is maybe two degrees warmer or even higher. So for the whole of human civilization, that has never happened. Right. We have never lived in a world uh, where you know it which is two degrees warmer. You know, the last time it was two degrees warmer, there were dinosaurs uh, on the planet. So that is a very sobering prospect if you think about it, that we are entering a completely new phase, completely uncharted mm. territory. So that to me seems to be the most uh, urgent issue. How do we address this? Okay, that's very interesting. I think uh, you hit uh, uh, something which is very close to our hearts here in India, because as you know, our Prime Minister has launched a coalition for disaster right. resilient infrastructure, we work CDRI, closely, yes. uh, and, and uh, World Bank is a partner, uh, yes. is working with that, so one right. of the partners' organizations. Uh, so I think uh, as far as uh, cooperation, uh, at that level is concerned, there's no doubt, at least India is strongly committed to that. And uh, what I wanted to ask you was that, uh, are there any lessons or uh, from the Indian experience which would be relevant to other Asian countries? Oh, absolutely. Our regions, absolutely. South absolutely. Asia, Southeast Asia, and also the, some of the island countries, Pacific oh, absolutely. islands. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, there are certain areas where I think India is an absolute world leader. Uh, and let me give you a few examples of that. And, and in fact, I'm surprised that the Indian press doesn't report more of this. So let me give you a few good examples. So the whole mm. issue of coastal resilience and early warning systems against cyclones. Um, you probably remember, you know, in 2001, when Odisha had the super cyclone, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were That's right. And it was just an absolutely devastating event. And now, you know, when we had Amphan last year, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, you know, it was a few hundred maybe. Now, of course, each death is a, is a tragedy, but if you look at the scale from where we came to where we are today, the whole system of early warning systems and evacuating people out of harm's way, the cyclone shelters that have been put in place on the coast, it, on the East Coast especially, that is an absolute marvel. Uh, I, I, and, you know, India has to be commended and lauded for this kind of uh, approach. And actually, Bangladesh is another country that has done similarly well. Uh, so when you said about other countries learning from India, I think this one is absolutely at the top of the list. They're, they're, I think you know, all countries in ASEAN, for example, would look to India to learn on how we did it. That's one uh, aspect. The other, I would say, is the whole uh, solar power uh, experience in India, where you know, now our target is 450 gigawatts by 2030. I think we'll comfortably uh, exceed that. Uh, so the whole uh, way in which solar power has been scaled up in India is absolutely remarkable. So some of the costs per unit, you know, is now less than three rupees per unit. So it's absolutely the lowest in the world anywhere. So that again is another, you know, absolutely stunning success story, which other countries would be, uh, you know, would want to. And when you mentioned the Pacific Islands, so solar power is something that is very, very relevant for the, for the. Uh, uh, Pacific yeah. Islands, and how India did this would be of great interest to them. So I think these two examples would be, you know, front and center. Good. I think that's very interesting. Uh, at RIS, we have launched an initiative called the Global Development Center, uh, which is funded with uh, also with the, from DFID. The idea of this center is precisely to take the uh, development experience uh, from India and from other successful countries in the global south and uh, spread it more widely hmm. so that, you know, the countries of the global south can benefit from each other's experience. Right. And that is why I asked you the question about, uh, you know, some of our experience being relevant. 
So, uh, do you think that this kind of a global development center has a has a good potential in the future? I absolutely think that. In fact, when I worked on China, one of the things that we um, sort of put in place, and then China did it, started scaling it up on their own, is this whole structured South-South cooperation. Uh, um, so, for example, let me give you an example from China. So, their Shanghai Med Center, the meteorological center in Shanghai, is absolutely world class. So the World Bank partnered with Shanghai, the Shanghai Med Center to do, you know, one week, two week courses for, you know, uh, hydromet specialists from other parts of uh, Asia, where they would go and stay there and then learn from the, the, the med specialists in China. Uh, I think the India Meteorological Department, for example, IMD is a, again a very, very high, highly capable uh, body. And we could run similar programs like that in India. That's just one example. There's so many others uh, that where other countries could benefit from India's experience. I mentioned solar, but another one is, for example, landslide prevention. Uh, you, you'll, you'll recall that, you know, we've had tremendous success in the reforestation of, the, you know, in the, especially in the Garhwal, sort of the Uttarakhand. Yeah. Right? And, and landslides have gone down tremendously, although it still happens, but, you know, it's much less. That's another good example of where countries could uh, would be interested in learning, learning from India. The whole issue of community-based DRM, uh, how do you, sort of put in disaster risk management uh, uh, capacity at the community level is another where you know india is a is a is a world leader so there are so many areas where this kind of a global center yeah. uh, would be very useful mm. yeah one of the uh, problems uh, which we are facing is the because you know a lot of india indian agriculture still depends on the uh, monsoon that's right and the rainfall and as a result of uh, climate change, the rainfall pattern has also be become highly variable. Yes. And we have extremes of uh, precipitation. So this is a challenge uh, we are facing. And, uh, you know, there are multiple, at multiple levels, uh, one, of course, is to have better use and better ma water management. Uh, and uh, this also includes the uh, water which comes in the urban areas. A lot of it simply runs off. That's right. And, uh, you know, we have a uh, uh, requirement of water in the urban areas. So uh, water management and uh, both in urban areas as well as in the agricultural sector is extremely important for us. Could you tell us if the World Bank is involved in some of these areas? Oh, absolutely. So this is, a, again, a one of the, I would say one of the most pressing uh, areas, especially the urban manage, urban water management uh, it's one of the critically important because it has implications not just for drinking water, but on things like urban flooding. So let me just give you an example from China. So in China, about, I would say, eight or nine years ago, they launched an initiative called Sponge Cities. Uh, and it was actually launched at a very high level by the premier, uh, Li, Li Ka-Cheng. And what Sponge Cities essentially means is to capture the water as it falls and not let it run, run off. So one of the problems in urban areas is that the lack of permeable space, right? Because you're putting in concrete and, you know, um, so the water runs off and then it goes into uh, the drains and the drains are overwhelmed if you have very high uh, rainfall. So what they're trying to do is to create more of uh, permeable space by, for example, uh, green roofs. So they're putting, uh, you know, greenery on top of roofs, permeable pavements. So the pav pavement, instead of being concrete, is something that can absorb water. Um, and then region, region, rejuvenating the uh, water bodies. Uh, you remember in Chennai in 2015, they had this terrible flooding. And one of the reasons is that, you know, Chennai had 300 traditional water bodies, lakes, which have been cemented over. Water bodies. Yeah. So in China, they are trying to systematically, you know, make this uh, sort of a part of their program. It has been tremendously successful. And the other thing is that it's also very labor intensive. So you can generate good jobs you know, for, for the poor in cities. So mm. I think, you know, India would be very well uh, positioned to launch this kind of a program for the cities. That's one. The second, let me share another story from China from with you, which is that I was once uh, in a lunch with the mayor of Chongqing. So Chongqing is the largest city in China, and it's probably one of the largest cities in the world. And the World Bank has invested, you know, probably $10 billion over the years in different projects for Chongqing. So the mayor turned to me and said, you know what's the most valuable thing the bank has done for us? I said, no, tell me. He said, you helped us prepare a drainage master plan. And that drainage master plan, I went back and checked. It's, you know, it's a few hundred thousand dollars grant. So it's a very small 
thing that we did. But the mayor, in the mayor's eyes, this was the most important thing that the bank had done for it because it saved them hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, you know, expenses in things like, you know, wastewater treatment plants and on. So it gave them a sort of a right. let to how to deal with urban flooding. So that's another thing that I feel in India, we would be well served, which is that, you know, if you have a population of say more than a million, every city should have a drainage master plan. I mean, my hometown is Patna. Every year, you know, we have this uh, uh, flooding uh, problem and it's not something that's very hard to, uh, to solve, but it just requires investments and, uh, you know, a little bit of political will. Yes, absolutely right. I think that's very closely connected to our plans to clean up the rivers like the Ganges. Exactly. Which are really having a lot of, <laughs> receive a lot of the untreated uh, sewerage. Absolutely. So I think this fits in very well with our initiative on that. So this it, is an another enough important to remember area. that when I was in college, and, the first, uh, coming to the first area, Ganga, Ganga, uh, Ganga action plan, when Rajiv Gandhi launched, launched it in 1984 yes. or 85. Yes. So. yes. No, uh, I think, uh, you know, we still have a long way to go before we can make the Ganga water suitable for uh, drinking. Exactly. Uh, but that's uh, something we'll have to work on. Yeah. Uh, the other important area is the health sector. In the health sector, although I know that this is not strictly speaking in your uh, uh, domain, but in the health sector, we have certain capabilities and, of course, we have certain deficits uh, in our health sector, especially our primary health sector. So that seems also an interesting area for, uh, you know, benefiting from the experience of global South countries, mutual benefit. Uh, does the World Bank get involved in the health sector? Oh, yes. To a large extent? So again, the health sector in India is a very, very large part of our lending. And unfortunately, I'm not at all an expert on that um, uh, area. But, you know, just as a sort of a lay person looking out from the outside, you know, this COVID app, uh, app that has been done for the vaccination, you know, where you, a billion people have been vaccinated using that. that that's another thing yeah. that, you know, countries would be very, very interested in learning how India did it. And just sort of the broader uh, digital ID that, you know, the Aadhaar and, you know, what is called the Aadhaar stack where they've built, you know, the UPI, the United, United yeah. Payment Interface on top of Aadhaar. It, it is, again, it's a very, very remarkable system where they have managed to give digital IDs to people for less than a dollar which I think is unprecedented. No country has come even close to rolling out such a massive program at such a low cost. Yeah, that is, I think, the whole question of digital inclusion and uh, digital tools for development, which is completely cross-cutting across several themes. Yeah. And the, so that's very interesting. Now we've got a certain number of areas where, uh, which will be very fruitful, mutually uh, beneficial for countries of the global south to work together. And they, what would you think, oh, this is an interview, but what would you think of a kind of workshop with the World Bank and the Global Development Center on how to take, uh, you know, how to move forward on this kind of uh, uh, activity? So, I, you know, I think that's a very uh, good area where potentially we could work together, where, whereby, um, you know, we identified a few areas. Uh, maybe we start with three or four or five maximum. And then we try and identify the correct experts in India. And then on the World Bank side, we could try and line up clients, you know, from different countries. And for, because I worked in East yeah. Asia for a long time and I'm, now I'm in South Asia, at least we could cover the whole of Asia. And now because of this, you know, WebEx and, you know, people are more comfortable teams, we can do this as yeah. a webinar. So it's, you know, almost at no cost. Yeah. That's right. It would be cost effective and it would be easy for people to participate. And of course, if it is Asia, then the time zone issue is not a serious exactly. problem. Yeah. Uh, we would definitely so, be interested so in that. I think this is an interesting idea. We, I, I will, uh, of course, take it uh, forward with our team here okay. and see. Uh, and uh, what would you think? Uh, of involving other partners like, like the Coalition for Disaster Relief Absolutely. and the yeah. International Solar Alliance into these things, this oh, kind absolutely. of a workshop. And we can easily pull them in because we are very closely with them. So Solar Alliance as well, Ajay, Ajay Mathur is a good friend. CDRI I know very well. We could easily pull them in and we can also bring in other partners like ADB, the Asian Development Bank or AIIB if you want. So that, that's not right. a problem at all. Right. Okay, good. Uh, 
So tell me if there are, uh, you know, in the forthcoming, as you mentioned, the COP26 is coming up. And uh, I see that the World Bank has uh, prepared a lot of very interesting papers uh, on uh, disaster, on climate change resilience, particularly for Latin America and Caribbean. And uh, I think what, uh, what uh, the lessons or the, the things which are happening there are to some extent also applicable to the Pacific Island countries. So do you think that uh, one could uh, sort of look at uh, the special problems of uh, small island countries? And there, uh, you know, we also have small islands, both in the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Yeah. So to some extent, we have some, and you mentioned the, uh, the off-grid solar yes. uh, power, which is there, and biomass is another. So these are areas where I think we have something to offer the small, small island countries. What do you think? So absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the Pacific islands are very unique, uh, as you well know, uh, in that, you know, if, if there's a one meter or two meter sea level rise in India, it will be devastating for the coastal, coastal cities and, you know, there'll be a lot of damage. But it's not that India will stop to exist, right? India is a very large country and, you know, uh, it will have very negative consequences, but, you know, we'll survive. But if you take the Marshall Islands or, you know, Kiribati, they will, it will cease to exist in 50 years. Maldives, Maldives is another one, right? Uh, so if, if it, it continues like this, most of Maldives will not exist in 50 years. And that is, a, again, I'm, we are in a completely new world, right? Because if you look at even the legal aspects of sea level rise, what is going to happen? Like, for example, where do these people go? Uh, are they migrants? Are they refugees? Um, there is no legal framework to deal with these kind of problems. So I think the world is now sort of is coming to grips with some of these issues. Um, and I, I'm not sure we have all the answers yet. But I think your specific question was that what can India sort of offer these Pacific islands? So as I said, I think solar is a, is a very, very good uh, example. I think community-based DRM is another very good uh, example where uh, the, the islands would be very interested uh, in dealing uh, with that. And then even things like early warning systems hydromet services, uh, because some of these islands, they're so, they're so few people, you know, it's very hard to fathom uh, that how few people they are. So, you know, their hydromet agency might have one person uh, in, in total, and, you know, that person can migrate to Australia or New Zealand, where he'll get a better pay. So, you know, there are really, really big capacity challenges. Um, so we were working with WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, when I was there, to try and help put in a training program for some of these uh, staff who work on hydromet and early warning systems. So again, that's another area where India could offer, you know, IMD could run training programs for officials of the Pacific Islands. So I think those would be my initial ideas. Yeah, well, certainly I think um, um, the meteorology and uh, our uh, space applications based on satellite, that's right. which, are, uh, which we are using to link different remote parts of India, to us uh, for various applications uh, could be useful, uh, I think, in uh, dispersed island communities. That's right. Uh, so that kind of, uh, that, that's another interesting area, how to improve connectivity through the use of uh, satellite technology. Right. So I think uh, we have given, <laughs> taken a lot, a, a enough of your time. Is there any uh, final message you would like to give us as far in the, you, know, you said that we are facing unprecedented challenges. I agree. I think COP26 is also going to be very tough. That's right. The way it looks. And you mentioned the whole issue of carbon space and the, and the kind of carbon justice, which is a hot issue. Uh, and it is going to be very difficult to handle this. Uh, and uh, I think we all wish that there was a magic wand that somehow we would get the technology to remove the carbon dioxide from True. the air, True. especially from power plants and from even directly from the air and, and uh, remove it. That That's would true. simply uh, take the lid off the pressure cooker, so to say. But uh, what are your, what does the World Bank uh, think of, uh, you know, the COP26 and beyond? What, what are they looking at, looking for? So, you know, we are very hopeful, I think, like the rest of the world, we hope that there'll be a substantial, you know, outcome in COP. Uh, but, you know, it's not, you know, these things are not run by logic or by, you know, fairness. Yeah. So there's many, there's many, there are many issues at play where, which we are not, 
which we can't control. Yeah. But I think, you know, even beyond COP, we need to start thinking about, you know, what, what yeah. the trajectory will be. So, for example, India, you know, despite being very poor and, um, you know, lots of people not having energy access, you know, India is now the fourth largest emitter in the world of carbon dioxide. So, yeah, you know, true. the question is that what trajectory will India take? It doesn't necessarily have to follow, you know, the, the dirty yeah. path that the Western countries took. Sure. Now, you see, if you look at uh, the whole business of uh, reducing greenhouse gases, governments, of course, have to agree. But the main actors involved are cities, industries, households, and so on. That's right. And uh, states. Now, we had the situation where the U.S. Uh, government pulled out of the Paris Accord. But uh, big states like New York, California, and That's even right. some of the big cities said, no, we are committed to it. Yes. So this raises the prospect of... Uh, of involving the actual actors in greenhouse gas, like particularly like since you have dealt with cities, uh, get a coalition of cities to commit to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that uh, would actually send a powerful signal to the governments also that uh, at the, at the sub-national level, there is a serious uh, in commitment on this. What do you think? I think that's that's a very good point, and certainly, you know, certain, some cities can can take the lead. You know, like for example, Indore, everyone talks that it's a cleaner city in India, right? So there are lots of good things that you can learn from the cities in India. But let me give you a slightly different example, which is that of cement. So you know, cement is one of the large, you know, in in terms of industrial processes, it's one of the largest emitters yes. of carbon, mm -hmm. right? But what very few people know is that more more than fifty percent of cement is bought by governments across the world. You know, because of infrastructure investments and so on. So this is a good example where government procurement policies can make a difference, right? If you start saying that, you know, we're only going to buy green cement, it, it increases the incentive for the private sector to invest in that kind of thing. So for example, Dalmia Cement in India is a, is a leader in this, this space. So, you know, if India, the government would say that, you know, from 2030, we are only going to buy green cement. You know, that, in, that would provide an incentive for the private sector to invest. Or even like cars, like, you know, you could say yeah. that from 2030, you know, all the buses in India are going to be electric. That will jumpstart our electric bus industry, you know, and people will start producing. So so those are the kind of examples where government action can sort of uh, spur yeah. more action. Good. I think uh, also now we come to the question of uh, what is the, what would be a optimum kind of housing uh, in right. the new age of climate uh, control, because the present, uh, most of us lives in homes where nobody thought much about insulation. Exactly. Uh, all we thought, you know, I mean, we hardly thought much about the heat, you know, uh, insulating the homes. Uh, of course, this is a big problem in Europe, Northern Europe, where exactly. they have extreme cold weathers. So they have moved on to, you know, putting in insulation and so on. But uh, in the developing world, uh, what uh, do you think is the potential for that? Uh, so, use so better that's, housing yeah. designs. That is a great example that you've said. And this is something that we are actually very actively engaged in. Whereby, as you said, you know, we haven't really thought about, you know, how to make uh, houses more uh, resilient against heat or even cold in the winter. And if you look at, for example, the British, you know, the way they, they used to design the houses, you know, with high ceilings, you know, cross ventilation, there was a much more thought given to that. So now we are trying to, for example, all the buildings that we finance, we are trying to make sure that that's part of it, you know, including use of local building materials, uh, you know, things like hollow bricks, you know, which are naturally uh, insulated, uh, making sure that there's cross ventilation. Um, so, you know, it's not that the whole of India is going to be air conditioned, you know, that every building is going to have air conditioning. That's not going to happen. So we have to rely on things like passive cooling. Uh, so it's really the design that's going to be critical. So one of the things we're trying to work with the government of India is on a green building code, where they gradually incentivize right. uh, that building standards are upgraded. Uh, but that said, you know, much of the building in India is informal. So it's not that they adhere to any code. Or, so we yeah. really have to think about the informal sector as well. Yeah. So for example, the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, you know, I didn't know the scale of this program till recently, because when I was in government, you know, it was not such a big program. Used to be called Indra Awas Yojana, yeah. but now it's like 10 million units are built every year. It's a huge program. So if just just this one program, if we could influence to build greener, to build more energy efficient, that would have a huge impact uh, in India. 
So those are the kind of things we are working on. Yeah, I think uh, at an early stage, if we can influence the design of the, uh, like the Prime Minister's Avas Yojana, exactly. uh, integrate uh, energy efficiency into that, that would be a huge achievement. Exactly. Uh, quite right. I am not sure whether what uh, thought thinking has gone into that. Uh, uh, anyway, the, even in the informal sector, people are much uh, very highly responsive to price signals. Exactly. If you have something which is economical yeah. and e economical to run, I think people will go for it. Yeah. So let me come to your activities. I see that you've written uh, edited two handbooks. One is a massive handbook on reconstructing after disasters, and the other one is on flood risk management uh, in cities. Yeah. Both, I think, are extremely interesting. And in fact, I'm happy that uh, one can download them. It's an open source yes. uh, thing. Uh, are you working on any, anything new at this time or any? So I'm getting more and more interested and I am working a lot on heat. Uh, so I think that is an issue that has not yet uh, gotten the attention that it deserves. So my team and I, we are trying to put together some analytical work on what can be done about heat in cities. Uh, in fact, we had a very interesting presentation by a professor from MIT uh, called uh, Professor Al Tahir, and he basically he does regional uh, downscale models of uh, heat and climate change, and he showed a very striking map where he said that there's like this crescent from Afghanistan, you know, through the Indo-Gangetic Plain right through to Bangladesh, where it will become the wet bulb temperature. Wet bulb temperature is the heat plus the humidity will cross 35 degrees centigrade, mm -hmm. which is beyond human capacity. That's and it's very striking, you know, this entire indo gangetic plane is going to be hit hard. I don't think our policymakers are yet, you know, aware of it. Well, we're already seeing it in the summers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The temperatures have been going up and... Uh, and, you know, people will die, you know, so we need to start thinking about things like heat shelters. Uh, um, almost like you have like cyclone shelters, yes, I think. Absolutely. Like right, uh, heat shelters. Yeah, we had heat waves uh, at the last two years. I remember we had heat waves and uh, there were a number of deaths, especially of children right. in the UP and uh, Bihar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was attributed to encephalitis, but it, uh, some doctors so feel it's actually yeah. heat stroke yeah. uh, for children. Yeah. And uh, I think the there is a need for uh, heat shelters, but particularly for the vulnerable people. Exactly. So it's a very interesting uh, work ahead. And uh, I don't know if, they, if the kind of heat islands which are coming up in cities, uh, if there is some thinking go going on into how to mitigate that. Uh, large of it, large of large part of it is because the cities are getting increasingly concrete. Exactly, exactly. Uh, with very little is, green, yeah, which show green that areas. I guess the thing you, to do is to have more greenery. Exactly, more trees. You know, if you have more trees in a neighborhood, it automatically reduces the temperature by one or two degrees. Yeah, trees, uh, if possible, uh, or even uh, kind of uh, urban gardens. Yes. Yes. Rooftop gardens yeah. or plants, or I don't know. There are people even growing vegetables on rooftops. So right. Yeah. I guess something like that. So very interesting, uh, Mr. Jha. It's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, benefiting from your experiences both uh, within India and across the world, uh, all over the world. And uh, very interesting uh, topics you are working on. Very relevant. And I think I look forward to further interaction with you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I would love to keep in touch. Yes. And let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Very Thank nice you. to meet you. No, we will take this idea of work, workshop on, sure. uh, with the Global Development Center. Sure. I have a workshop uh, or a webinar, online workshop on uh, many of these themes, which, are, which we are also interested in. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.